Citrus canker is a, another very important disease for the Florida citrus industry and uh, there are some different kind of strategies that are used in terms of managing this disease, so I'll go through some of those. Uh, a couple of elements to begin with. There's a, a, a very important difference between fresh fruit uh, and the importance of canker management compared to processing fruit groves. And there are some varietal differences such as grapefruit versus oranges and so on. So as we develop and implement management strategies, we have to keep in mind what the utilization of the fruit is and manage our, our practices accordingly. The other difference is that there are regions of the state that have become more or less endemic with the disease and we know that it's more important to provide intensive management of those areas than it is in areas that are either disease free or on the very early stages of having uh, canker infection. So again, the management tactics take into consideration the kind of varieties, the utilization, and then the area of the state and the incidence of canker. So important elements that, that are essential in the uh, disease-free or low incidence areas of canker start with sanitation and decontamination. In an area where you don't have canker, it's not widespread. It's critical that we do everything to maintain that. And in movement in and out of the grove, vehicles, equipment, and so on, sanitation is extremely important and the details of that are, are well known and uh, implemented properly that could do a lot to help uh, prevent the incidence of canker. Removal of infected plant material is also an, an element in canker management uh, for different reasons than with greening, but essentially uh, removing trees that are infected with canker is an important part of managing areas that are uninfected and become infected and by uh, quickly removing the source, the slowing of spread can be accomplished in those areas. Uh, in contrast, in areas that are endemic, tree removal in itself is not necessary for proper management and may not be economical, so we don't recommend it in that case. Uh, moving from tree removal, uh, you can look at pruning and also defoliation as strategies to selectively eliminate infected plant material, and those two have a place more so in areas that are uh, low incidence of canker and by removing those sources you can reduce the inoculum and therefore slow the spread and uh, prolong the period of time before the disease becomes endemic. So it's a very important uh, aspect to consider when developing strategies for managing canker. Another element that's equally important is uh, the role that an insect, the citrus leaf miner, plays in the ability of the canker bacterium to get into the citrus plant. Uh, we know that the damage on leaves and twigs from leaf miner allows the entry of canker bacteria into the plant at a much higher level than normally occurs when the plants are not infected by the insect. So proper management of citrus leaf miner is also a, a consideration in developing and implementing a, a strategy. Uh, foliar applications, some of the systemics have uh, some utility against citrus leaf miner and in concert with biological control there are uh, opportunities to reduce populations, reduce the damage caused by citrus leaf miner and therefore slow the accumulation of inoculum and the spread of the disease. So those are important pieces on the entomology side of managing canker. Managing canker in an endemic situation, that is an area where there's a, a a lot of inoculum around in the area is a little more challenging, but it's, it's very important both for fresh and processing that we consider the opportunities that are available. Uh, first and foremost is the use of windbreaks, and uh, canker being spread by windblown rain is very vulnerable to uh, movement into the grove and between trees in the grove, and so the placement of windbreaks around the margins of, of groves as well as within the grove to partition out areas and change the wind direction and speeds has a tremendous impact on the spread of canker within an area. So uh, in an area of endemic canker, it's very important to consider the development and implementation of windbreaks. With windbreaks in place, uh, the use of copper and other fungicides uh, is a strategy that will help with reducing the amount of inoculum pressure in a grove. Uh, it won't eliminate the bacterium, it doesn't go into the plant and remove the bacterium that's down inside the tissues, but it has the effect of lowering the amount of material that's out on the surface 
which when the, the plant is wet, causes the spread from leaf to leaf and tree to tree. Uh, our IFAS recommendations cover in great depth the opportunities to use copper and a few other materials uh, to help suppress canker inoculum in the field. And then finally, as I mentioned, in the areas where leaf miner uh, has an impact on the movement of canker into an area, in endemic canker areas, managing leaf miner is essential because the rate of spread and the intensity of the infection is much greater when leaf miner is not held in check. So again, the, the importance of leaf miner management. Uh, it's important to note that leaf miner doesn't actually vector the disease, but rather the damage that it causes allows for the entry of the pathogen into the plant system. It's important to emphasize that any time you're working with insecticides, fungicides, any of the pesticidal materials, that you consult the labels. There's a lot of very useful information that uh, we obviously can't uh, cover in all these details, and so uh, it's, it's very important to go to those labels. And on the same note, there's a lot of additional information available, the details of the management strategies, when they can best be used, and those are available through the University of Florida IFAS and will be the topic of these workshops as we move around. So uh, we encourage you to uh, get the general sense from these discussions and then refer to additional information that's available in, in various sources. Uh, the University of Florida, uh, IFAS, the center here at Lake Alfred, all intend to continue our efforts to meet the challenges of the Florida citrus industry and in concert with state and federal officials we want to do everything possible to assist with the management of these diseases in Florida. We are entering a young red grapefruit grove for a citrus canker inspection. Inspection for canker is quite a bit different from that for greening in that the symptoms will appear on the exterior of the canopy of the tree. Citrus canker bacteria prefer to infect the young flush growth, which is necessarily on the exterior of the canopy. They can take advantage of leaf miner wounds, which are also on the uh, new flush growth. So uh, the, the need to burrow into the canopy is, is not near as, uh, as vital for canker surveys as it is for a greening survey. Uh, the samples that you'll take for citrus canker can be submitted to the the plant pathology laboratory in Gainesville. They should be double bagged and submitted uh, promptly, not uh, uh, kept in your car for a long period of time. Diagnostic process for citrus canker is much faster, much uh, uh, simpler than the diagnostic process for citrus greening. A canker sample can be diagnosed with nearly 100% accuracy based on symptoms alone. And with skill and practice, you should be able to identify a citrus canker lesion with a high degree of of confidence in the field based on the, the uh, symptoms that I'll describe for you in just a moment. Uh, a greening sample may take three to four weeks for a diagnostic process to be completed, whereas a canker sample could be uh, finished in a matter of a day or so. If necessary, we could call you the day the sample arrives and, and let you know the, the diagnosis. Again, it's important to realize that this is a bacterial disease that spreads easily in water splash and on, uh, by human contact, so sanitizing is important. During the process, moving from block to block, you may elect to, to sanitize your, your hands and your feet so that you don't transmit the disease unwittingly on your person. We're going to look at some symptoms. In fact, this tree here on the end of an aisle is a good place to start an inspection. Wherever human activity is concentrated in a staging area where you turn corners, where uh, new trees have recently been planted, those are good places to concentrate. When you conduct a canker inspection during the year is important. It will be visible throughout the year. This isn't a disease that will disappear during the cold months, uh, but it will probably peak and be most visible uh, from the July, August, September time frame after it's had several flushes to infect and the disease has built up through the growing season. As we look at the symptoms uh, on these particular leaves, right away you see brown spots with bright yellow halos that are easy to spot from quite a distance away. You would not need to make uh, a hand contact with this tissue to, to realize that you've got characteristic citrus canker symptoms here. The lesions are brown. They will be raised on both sides. You can tell that by actually feeling the the lesion on both sides there will be a small bump. Sometimes the center of that lesion will fall out. If you've got a hand lens you can examine it closely and look for telltale evidence of a water-soaked boundary around that necrotic tissue which is 
an indication of a bacterial disease. But this is an excellent view of a fairly heavy citrus canker infection. Some of them have uh, infected through the stomatal apertures on the leaves. We've got a, a small section here where leaf minor wounding has facilitated in, uh, infection. Infection is much easier if the tissue is wounded, whereas it may take a thousand to ten thousand cells uh, per milliliter of uh, a carrier water, rainwater, to cause this sort of infection. Somewhere around ten to a hundred cells in that same droplet of water can find their way into this tissue and cause the infection. Bacteria that land on the exterior of these leaves and don't get inside the plant tissues are harmless. So any bacteria that have landed on these leaves during the day have undoubtedly dried out and died already. If it were to start raining or we had a heavy dew here or the irrigation system came on and wet these leaves, within a matter of minutes bacteria would ooze to the surface and be available for uh, transmission either by me touching them or by uh, aerosol droplets that are created as the wind blows or water droplets smack into those uh, puddles of bacteria on the leaf and splatter them into the surrounding area. That's typical of a bacterial disease and citrus canker has that characteristic just like uh, other bacterial diseases. You'll notice that where equipment comes in contact with the tree it's very often where you'll see the symptoms first We've got some vegetation here that could interfere with a survey. It may be that timing a survey would, would be timed with a, a recent mowing so you're not impeded by a high vegetation and the, the uh, uh, risks of, of tripping and falling. You can walk more easily in a, in a mowed uh, middle. You should be inspecting probably four times a year. You're doing that for greening as well. Um, some scientists believe that you can do a dual purpose or a multi-purpose survey. Others discourage that. I think a well-trained surveyor should eventually be able to, to look for more than one disease at a time. But for the, uh, the novice, maybe it's best to do a separate survey for citrus canker. Uh, that would be the easier of the two to learn. And then uh, work on the developing uh, skills for greening independently with a separate survey. Citrus canker disease usually starts on the foliage. I would say uh, better than 95% of the time it's going to initiate on the foliage, but eventually it can also infect the fruit and the twigs. We have some fruit here that are showing typical symptoms. Now those lesions would gradually get larger through the growing season, may cause the fruit to fall off early. They would certainly disqualify it for fresh fruit use. That uh, sort of uh, Raised, bumpy texture is obvious on this. Of course, we can't feel the opposite side of a lesion on a fruit. But it does have that raised, corky texture that's typical of a citrus canker lesion. And it will get that yellow halo. The yellow halo is a, uh, a, a passing symptom. It may regreen over time, uh, particularly if it's an early infection. But you'll always have that raised, bumpy texture there. This fruit will probably be uh, susceptible to infection for as long as it is enlarging. Uh, once it reaches full size, even though it's not ripe, it becomes more uh, resistant to the disease. But all through the expansion phase, it's susceptible to new lesions. So you may have some very small lesions that happened recently. These larger lesions probably were initiated when the fruit was perhaps a fingernail size or, or so. Let's go down the row and take a look here. Now we've got lots of vegetation in the way here and this would create a wet situation that could hold moisture in place for a long period of time and sure enough there are some symptoms buried in that grassy weedy tissue. Both leaf miner aided and stomatal infections. Now if that's all you had to see on a tree that would take a pretty good inspector to pick that out. You might miss that with the first survey in the year but the way this disease amplifies through the growing season, your second survey a month or two later, you're probably going to pick up quite a few more lesions and it'll be as, as obvious as, as it is on these trees before us. Again, we would look where you're likely to make contact with equipment down low on the skirt of the tree. There's one very small lesion here. We take a pretty good inspector to pick these up but there's enough of them there that eventually you miss one, you see the next one. Again, there's infection in this uh, middle between the trees, which is hard to access, but even from this 
distance, I can see citrus canker lesions uh, in the interior of that canopy. So let's take a look at some other symptoms on citrus that might look like a citrus canker to the beginning inspector. Here's a disease that's called melanose. It's caused by a fungus that usually gets established on dead twigs, such as we see here. And it causes a raised lesion, but it's a small black tarry lesion, rough in texture, and it's called melanose, not citrus canker, but it's one you'll see quite frequently, and it might be confused if you're uh, just beginning this uh, career as a surveyor. Here's some older canker lesions that have apparently been on since last year. You'll notice that most of the lesions that we're seeing are on the flush that came out uh, this spring with the bloom. Leaf miner aided lesions again. Now here's another disease. Along with melanose, these small black tarry spots, we've got another disease that can look a little bit like citrus canker in some respects. This is called greasy spot. That's another fungal disease. And it will defoliate a tree gradually as it gets worse and worse. Most of the time, a single spray in the springtime or early summer can uh, go a long way to minimizing the impact of that. But that's a very common disease in Florida. And uh, it, it's easy to distinguish from a citrus canker lesion. For a quick review of the symptoms we've just seen, these are typical citrus canker lesions. A brown necrotic spot with a yellow halo. It's raised on both sides. That's the back of the leaf. There's the front. Very easy to spot from a distance. This one is citrus canker as well, but they're clustered together because they invaded a leaf miner wound on the back side of the leaf. Again, they're raised, brown necrotic, but a little bit uh, uh, disorganized in that pattern created by the leaf miner. Let's compare that to some melanose. That's the fungal disease that uh, infects uh, uh, leaves and fruit and stems. It causes a raised black tarry lesion. You won't see a corresponding lesion on the opposite side, so that's a pretty easy one to tell apart. And it's much smaller than a canker lesion. There's a leaf miner wound that has not been invaded at all. You can see a, a little mottling on the upper surface, and that is uh, melanose again on the tip of that leaf. There's an older canker lesion, one that has turned entirely necrotic in the center. It's possible for that tissue to fall out, call, called uh, shot holing. There's another citrus canker lesion. Those probably took place in the last flush of last year, and they've been around since then. May have provided much of the inoculum to start the disease on these uh, flush leaves in the spring of uh, 2007. Now this last one we'll look at, it has melanose on it, but the lesion I want to point out is this greasy spot lesion. That's a fungal pathogen. Looks a little like citrus canker. It's slightly raised but smooth. It does have a brown necrotic center and some chlorosis around it, but it does not have that roughened, uh, corky appearance. That's a fungal disease, very common on most citrus in Florida. A good tactic to use as you survey was to you, let your eyes follow a W pattern on the canopy of the tree slowly. It may take you a minute or so to look at one side of the tree while your partner examines the other side. You might use a Z pattern for some uh, change of pace. You, it's difficult to maintain concentration over a long period of time, so anything you can do to remain alert as you survey is a good idea. As we finish up this survey, I want to emphasize that as easy as it has been to find citrus canker symptoms in this grow, it's always important to find it as early as possible so that you can instigate some management techniques immediately. Uh, it would be possible for this grower to perhaps uh, defoliate some trees, cut out limbs that have uh, a lot of symptoms on them, minimize the amount of inoculum here, uh, maybe even remove some trees that are badly infected. But all of those things can't be done unless you're certain you've got citrus canker and that requires a good survey and a quick uh, diagnosis. This is a combined effort of uh, uh, Jim Graham and, and Pete Timmer and Holly Chamberlain and, that, and uh, they've uh, given me this presentation to kind of modify for our purposes here for the CHIRP uh, training programs. 
Again, we're going to emphasize, and we've said it before, decontamination is still an integral part of our uh, canker management scheme. Uh, we, we started with it back in the 80s when we first had citrus canker, and it's going to continue to be an important part as we try to manage this disease now that it's endemic in Florida. You need to uh, decontaminate, certainly in areas where citrus canker has yet to become established. It will prolong your disease-free period for a considerable amount of time. Uh, weather will probably eventually break down your, your uh, disease freedom, but uh, anything you can do to keep things clean is to your benefit, believe me. Uh, you certainly want to decontaminate if you don't know what is active in your area. You're decontaminating for canker. It doesn't have any effect on greening spread, but it certainly is important when it comes to citrus canker. Now, you need to use common sense. Once citrus canker is uh, firmly uh, embedded in an area, decontamination between blocks may be pretty much meaningless, and, and you don't need to concentrate it on so much. But when you leave that area, uh, you certainly need to decontaminate the equipment before they go into another production area. We've got six elements to our basic citrus canker management practices, uh, starting with this uh, decontamination that we've harped on all morning long. You've got to start with healthy trees. We've had a presentation on the nursery program. Now we're going to talk about excluding and suppressing inoculum and various ways we can uh, accomplish that. We'll look at uh, susceptibility of cultivars and intended market. Harold Browning mentioned that a little bit in the video. Then we're going to talk about windbreaks. Harold covered a little bit of, about that as well. We'll get more specific. And lastly, how to use copper sprays to your benefit for citrus canker management. This whole idea of isolating blocks of high-value citrus uh, is going to be a new component. If you're in the fresh fruit, uh, grapefruit business, or navel oranges, uh, it, seriously consider uh, getting a, a, uh, an isolated zone in which to produce those, those crops. Now, this is not going to happen overnight, but if you're replanting, um, consider getting those apart from other citrus as much as you can so that you don't have inoculum spillover between those. Invariably, uh, as we've looked at citrus canker for almost 20 years here in, in Florida, grapefruit seems to be the trap crop for that disease. So uh, take that advice and realize that as you try to grow grapefruit for the fresh fruit market, it's going to be a big challenge. But I, I want to encourage you, don't, uh, don't fear the labor or doubt the reward of doing a good job of, of managing a grapefruit. I think there is still uh, great profit to be made there. You, you need to take uh, uh, a special pains in the exposed areas. You can chemically defoliate, you can remove infected trees, uh, you can selectively take out branches. All of that work needs to be done with uh, care that you're sanitizing, working in a dry part of the day. And you have to have frequent inspections in order to customize your, your applications of these management tools. So we've got uh, a new approach by isolating uh, and separating the high value, most susceptible citrus from other citrus. Uh, to have these uh, isolated blocks continue in areas where canker has not yet shown up or is just beginning to appear, continue that very rigid decontamination and try to have a single entry and exit into those production areas. And inspect frequently four times a year is not too much. Well-timed four times a year can really go a long way to customizing your program for maximum benefit. Copper sprays, surprisingly, are not that good as a preventative. They don't give you much uh, relief from the incursion of canker into a canker-free area. But they are useful for slowing down the disease once it arrives. So we, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about how to use that in a timely manner in just a moment. So if you've got that uh, few trees with a single focus, you can decontaminate with extreme rigor, uh, limit equipment movement as much as possible, and any activities where you have to come in contact with the tree uh, try to limit that to the dry parts of the day if possible. And then you can destroy or, or buckhorn or chemically defoliate any neighboring trees that are around your infected trees that you're going to remove. That's not, there's not a good formula for how to do that. Uh, if we were in the eradication phase, we had some good epidemiology to tell us that 1,900 feet was a good way to eliminate the disease altogether, but we have different uh, uh, goals in mind now. We want to keep trees in production for as long as possible. It may not be for fresh fruit, it may be for process. So we uh, need to kind of uh, use uh, um, 
as many um, guidelines and tips as possible about how far to move away from an infected tree uh, for handling exposed trees for, with uh, defoliation or, or uh, uh, buckhorning. If you're in an area where canker is already widespread, it's not going to do you any good to take out individual trees. You may still have some productivity left in those for processing, so leave them in place and try to manage uh, the disease rather than to lessen inoculum loads by a, a futile attempt to get rid of, of uh, infected trees. Now, if you have some real hot spots that are noticeable in an area, it still may be worth your while to consider eliminating those infected trees. But now you're going to have to fall back on uh, the other four components, windbreaks, some leaf miner control, uh, some vigor management, ways to keep the trees from flushing uh, too vigorously through the season. Remember, citrus canker attacks that new growth. So if you can limit that after you've got your crop set, uh, that will help uh, manage the disease a little bit better. And the copper sprays are, are going to be part of your, your management. And as Harold said in his uh, uh, part of the video, you have to consider your, your uh, susceptibility. High susceptible crops like grapefruit and navel oranges and, uh, are going to take uh, more care than those that are more tolerant to the disease. Things like uh, uh, tangerines and uh, uh, valencias. We'll talk a little bit more about valencias and some of their uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde tendencies um, in, in just a moment. And then again, your market destination. If you're striving to go into the fresh fruit market, you're going to have to start uh, right from the beginning with the, the highest level of citrus canker disease management that you can achieve. Um, if they don't make that grade, if you've got blemishes, you can always go into the processed market with fruit that are graded out at the packing house. If you're going into processing, your goal is different. You want to try to keep the fruit on the tree for as long as possible. Canker will knock fruit off of the tree and uh, knock your production down considerably. Certain varieties are worse about that than others. But uh, you, you will be able to go easily to the processor. There's no risk of transmitting the disease in the, uh, the processing uh, procedure. So grapefruit going to the fresh fruit market, there is no tolerance for blemishes on grapefruit. One day we may reach the point where we can set a tolerance level for citrus canker, but we are not at that point yet. So you have a very high standard to meet. No canker blemishes can be on any fresh fruit that are, are going to leave the, the state. It's surprising that uh, a lot of our oranges for processing happen to be fairly susceptible, some of them highly susceptible to citrus canker, and they tend to drop their fruit when they get a few lesions on them. And that can mean that you have nothing to take to the plant to squeeze. A hamlin is bad about that, and it's about 40% of our round orange crop. There are some other early oranges that are actually more susceptible than hamlin, uh, to citrus canker, and they're going to have problems uh, keeping those clean. Those are uh, very popular varieties, uh, mostly for early season color in the juice, and it's going to require some careful attention to managing. Uh, pineapple is in that group. Navel, of course, goes mostly to uh, fresh fruit, I think entirely to fresh fruit, so you're, you're managing that one for, for no lesions whatsoever. But pineapple will drop its fruit if it gets a few lesions on it. You won't have anything to, to harvest. Valencia tends to be more tolerant of the disease in general, and mid-sweets are more tolerant. More to say about Valencia in just a minute. And, and the uh, mandarin hybrids tend to be kind of all over the map. Some of them uh, carry the mandarin uh, tolerance into the hybrid very nicely, and others not so well. Mineola is one of those that is uh, on the high side of susceptibility. So keep that in mind, and most mineolas are going to go to uh, uh, fresh fruit production as well. Now, if you get into the mandarins uh, that are purely mandarins, not hybrids, they are very tolerant to the disease. So that may affect uh, what you decide to, to replant. Now, a little bit more about Valencias. If you push Valencias very hard on a very vigorous rootstock, the early stages of that uh, production period seem to be extremely susceptible to citrus canker. And we've had a number of places where uh, Valencias have been badly damaged by canker, surprisingly when we thought they were fairly tolerant to the disease. So if you're pushing them hard, which is going to be the way to be profitable in Florida in the future with citrus uh, greening and citrus canker both uh, nipping at your heels, uh, keep in mind that that's going to uh, make those trees very susceptible to citrus canker. And you may have to exercise a, 
a con containment program or a, a management program that recognizes that higher susceptibility. The use of windbreaks, Harold mentioned th this to a certain extent in his video. They're going to be absolutely necessary for susceptible varieties and for, for fresh fruit production. Uh, and depending on your location, uh, in central Florida where you may have some natural windbreaks around smaller blocks of, of uh, fruit, it may not be as necessary as say down in the southwest where there are large acreages that are pretty much open territory. What you're trying to do with a windbreak is reduce the wind speed. You're not trying to stop the wind altogether. So it's not as formidable a task as you might think. If you get the wind speed down below 18 to 20 miles an hour, the uh, canker bacterium is not going to disperse that readily. Uh, tall windbreaks are not a good idea. Uh, you'll get excess shade from them. They're susceptible to wind throw. And you'll be sorry you planted real tall varieties in the end. Um, there are uh, positive effects from a windbreak about seven to ten times the height of that uh, tree. And of course your trees don't come in uh, automatically 20, 25 feet high. You're going to have to grow them up to that size and then maintain that hedgerow or that windbreak over time. Some varieties uh, that we can use for that, we'll, we'll mention those in just a moment. But for uh, Fresh uh, fruit, consider about a five to 10 acre block, particularly if it's a susceptible variety like navel or grapefruit. You may have to hedge it on all sides in order to gain the, the benefits of a windbreak there. But for processing, um, you can uh, use a, a lot lower density and just put those windbreaks down the row and not on all four sides. Some species of plants to use for windbreaks. Uh, certainly southern red cedar, that was uh, shown in the video. That makes an excellent, uh, rather fast growing windbreak. Very tolerant, easy to get. Um, you can get all male trees if you like so you don't have seedling problems. It can be a kind of a weedy tree if you get uh, female trees and, you, and the birds scatter the berries all around the place. Uh, pines, both uh, slash and loblolly can work. There are some eucalyptus varieties that are being investigated by Bill Castle and others at IFAS that uh, you should look into. Uh, non-spreading bamboo is a good choice. If you don't get the non-spreading bamboo, you may be in the cane pole business in a hurry. Wax myrtle is a good choice. It's a native plant, good uh, wildlife uh, cover as well. And some, some viburnums are, are good uh, choices as well. Now for citrus canker uh, control using pesticides, this is where we usually end up when people think about citrus canker management. Uh, how do I, what do I spray for management? Well, we don't have anything superior to copper right now. Uh, there are a number of other products that perform pretty well in the laboratory and in greenhouse trials, but they don't seem to hold up when we get them out into the field. So we're still recommending copper in various forms, copper uh, hydroxide, copper oxychloride, basic copper sulfate, uh, copper ammonium carbonate, any form of copper does a good job of suppressing the, the disease in the field. The copper ion is what does the job and you need to keep it in place uh, as much as possible on the new flush materials so that the, when the pressure is on by leaf miner and uh, susceptible uh, aged tissues, you've got some copper in place there to kind of knock the disease back. It is certainly not a, a, a cure-all, but it's the best we have at this time. Some of the other products that are being investigated try to uh, activate the resistance mechanisms in the host plants. Those show promise, but we're not ready to, to uh, employ those just yet. And there are some other products that, uh, other than copper, that have antibacterial properties that may eventually one day prove to be useful in the field, but we're quite a ways from uh, recommending any of those at this time. Your best bet is still a copper compound. Now this is the only graph I'm going to show you, so stick with me here. This uh, high, this is disease incidence on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So the more this, this uh, graph goes up here indicates a higher disease level. These are your control plants, nothing applied to them. If you apply copper alone, that's that blue line. It knocks it down maybe 20% uh, or so. If you put windbreaks and copper together, you get these lower lines down here where disease incidence is knocked by about half. Now that's, a, that's worth doing. That's worth the expense of putting in that windbreak, and it's worth the expense of applying those copper compounds. I wish we could get it lower to where we were getting uh, almost no disease incidence, but this is what's 
happening in the field. And that's about the best we can expect. Dry years, the performance is better than during wet years. Now here's our, our biggest challenge for managing citrus canker, and that's on fresh grapefruit. Look at the number of copper sprays that are listed up there. I think you've got six, maybe eight uh, as you get into uh, August. Everywhere you see uh, CU on there, that's an abbreviation for copper. So you start with a spring flush uh, application. You're trying to control scab on here as well, so there's going to be some fungicides applied in between, but you've got a late April, early to mid-May, early June, late June, late July, and maybe some in August, depending on what the weather is like. That can be eight separate sprays of copper trying to keep those lesions off of the fruit for as long as possible. For uh, fresh market oranges and, and some uh, uh, fall glow tangerines and uh, tangelos and things like that, we're looking at perhaps four sprays of copper, as shown there on the slide. Uh, late April, early to mid-May, then early June and early July. And you're getting more than just canker with this. You're managing some melanose and some greasy spot at the same time. Now, for those uh, varieties that are susceptible to alternary, you're going to have to put some strobilurin fungicides in that mix as well. But the copper programs are the same for those with some added uh, strobilurins to get that alternaria in check. Alternaria can be a devastating problem on fresh fruit as well. Uh, so don't minimize the uh, fungal disease management while you're concentrating on canker. For processing early oranges, probably three additional copper sprays in April, May, and June will do the job. Remember, you're just trying to keep the trees, uh, or the, the fruit on the trees, keep them from falling off so that they will reach maturity and you'll have something to squeeze. And for late oranges, which are more tolerant, you can uh, knock that down to about two additional copper sprays and still do a good job of canker management in May and June. Now, as we have, uh, mentioned earlier, that leaf miner can be a real stinker. It does uh, enhance the efficacy of canker inoculum by about 10 to 100 times. So anything you can do to manage the leaf miner pays big dividends. And those are some of the recommendations in brief that uh, Mike Rogers had in his presentation earlier. You really don't need to pay as much attention to the spring flush because the populations tend to be low there. But be on the alert. They can, uh, after a mild winter, you may have a, uh, a big reproductive uh, burst in the spring that will uh, cost you uh, through the entire season. So here's our review of the management schemes. Uh, you've got to start clean and keep decontaminating. You need to exclude and suppress inoculum as much as possible, and that's more important than the canker-free areas. Consider what market you're shooting for and what varieties you're growing that can customize your management plan. Use windbreaks intelligently. Apply copper sprays and control that leaf miner. And if possible, there's a good idea, try to prohibit hurricanes. <laughs>